David, of course, uh, really needs no introduction from me because his public profile is so high. Um, it's a, a very sad Saturday or Sunday or Thursday that I don't open the LRB or the Guardian or the TLS uh, to read something by him. He tells me he could have stopped writing so much um, in these places now that he's head of department. I hope that's, that's not the case. When I was at Trinity Hall, as Master Trinity Hall, I know two of the very best lectures I heard there, uh, apart of, of course, by the senior tutor, Claire, Claire Jackson on the Stuarts, was David's uh, public lectures there, showing his range. Um, one of them was about his m a recent book about democracy and autocracy, but the other one, showing his other major interest, was about sport, about the politics of the Olympic Games, the three Olympic Games held in London, taking that, uh, those three events as a way of teasing out some very significant events um, in politics and in cultural history and identity. David has written many books which show his very deep scholarship and lucid analysis of very big questions which are immediately accessible not only to scholars but also to a wider public. He started with a book on pluralism and the personality of the state in 1997. He moved on to a book on political hypocrisy, which I always like to think was an argument that hypocrisy is a good thing and that we're facing the question of which hypocrite should we choose as our next leader of this country. Followed by a book on the politics of good intentions. And I always like to think that good intentions are a bad thing and get us into trouble. He then wrote a book on the confidence trap, looking at the relationship or the differences between democracy and autocracy in facing various crises, and most recently his short book on politics. On top of these major books, David has been leading a uh, Leverhulme Center uh, research project on conspiracies. And he's turning his attention now to uh, uh, other theme, which is about the internet, and tonight's lecture, his inaugural lecture, is on that theme, political theory and real politics in the age of the internet. David. Thank you very much, Martin. Is the microphone working? Because one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to stream this outside as well because this is the age of the internet. Thank you for that kind introduction. I also want to thank Martin for his support of this department in recent years, which has been invaluable. Um, before I start, I want to say a couple of things about the poster. You may not have seen the poster for this event. Um, if you have seen it, you'll know it has a picture of the Houses of Parliament in the background, and then in the foreground, a big red telephone box. And the reason the telephone box is there is because, I quote, we couldn't find a picture of the internet. <laughs> that makes it an opposite image for this lecture, as I hope you'll see. If you've read the small print, you'll see it says that drinks and there's a reception at 6 o'clock. I feel I should warn you, it's now 10 past 5. I'm planning to speak for maybe 55 minutes. I hope not too much more. And then happy to take a couple of questions. So we may not get to drinks till maybe 6.20, but they will be available from 6 o'clock. So <laughs> there's a door at the back. Uh, you can come and go. When I was thinking about what I might say this evening, it struck me that um, an inaugural lecture is a somewhat political occasion, given the conventions of the genre. As I understand it, the expectations are to survey the field and then also to explain why the place where you're happening to be giving the lecture is the most important place for the study of that field. So you have to be panoptic and parochial, <laughs> making the universal sound local and making the local sound universal, which is what politicians do especially when they're standing for election. And if they can sound sincere while they're doing it, they often get elected. I'm not a politician, so my sincerity is not in question. <laughs> I will mean it when I say that Cambridge is the most important place for the study of the subjects I'm going to be talking about tonight. Also, because I'm not a politician, this is not a political lecture. It's only political in one or two places. It's a lecture about politics in political theory. So I'm interested in precisely those questions. Can you make universal claims about politics given local differences? Or to put it the other way around, can you allow local differences to get in the way of making universal claims about politics? Those are some of the 
oldest, timeless questions of political theory, but they've been given a recent focus in the last five to ten years by an ongoing debate within contemporary political theory about what's often called the difference between moralism and realism, and that's what I'm going to talk about this evening. Moralism, and these are big generalizations, but moralism on the whole is associated with the large moral claims about justice and right that cut across political differences. And realism is associated with the thought that political differences cut through those large moral claims. So it's not the case that the moralists are all universalists and the realists are all localists. But I think it is true that realists on the whole tend to come down on the side of, and this is a phrase that's borrowed from Bernard Williams and has become popular in this literature, the idea that the truths about politics hold, I quote, now and around here. But it also doesn't mean that realists are relativists, but they do tend to emphasize contingency, or to use another word, context. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about the realism-moralism debate this evening is because a lot of people who are associated with the realist side of that argument are also associated with Cambridge. Bernard Williams, of course, he was associated with lots of other places as well. John Dunn, who I'm delighted to see is here. Raymond Goyce. A declaration of interest. I've seen the occasional list of Cambridge realists that includes my name on it quite a long way down the list after the more distinguished names. And when you see a list like that, you always wonder, what the hell is this club that I joined without realizing that I ever signed up? And so I want to try and say this evening what I think that club is. Um, it's also because a lot of the most interesting stuff that's recently been written has been written by younger scholars, some of whom are also here tonight, who also not just are at Cambridge, but are associated with this department. So in this lecture, I want to try and say what I take realism to mean in this debate, or to put it a slightly different way, what it would mean to be realistic about politics in political theory. And then in the second half, or possibly the last third of this lecture, I want to try and apply it to the final phrase in my title. So I'm going to ask what it might mean to be realistic about politics in the age of the internet. And the reason I want to ask that question is because I think it's a really important question. I think we've barely begun to answer it. Certainly in political theory, almost no one has begun to answer it. <clears throat> and I think the time to answer it is now, and the place to answer it is around here. So I'm going to explain at the end why I think it's so important to do this stuff in Cambridge. So let me just start by saying a little bit about um, what realism means here. So if you're in a department like this department, which both has political theorists and IR scholars, it's a politics and international studies department, you quickly become aware that there's more than one kind of realism. There are actually lots, but there are two prominent kinds. There's the realism that I'm going to be talking about, which is realism in political theory. And then there's realism in international relations, which is sometimes associated with the idea of realpolitik. That is, international relations realism is sometimes thought to be a particular preoccupation with power and self-interest in the international arena. And political theory realists are often at pains to distinguish themselves from IR realists, to separate themselves out from realpolitik. So political theory realism often wants to stand somewhere between moralism, which is taken to ignore power, to neglect it, to downplay its significance, and realpolitik, which is taken to worship power, to fetishize power. So political theory realism sometimes looks like it stands somewhere between John Rawls, who's the arch moralist on these accounts, the great theorist of justice, and say Henry Kissinger, who's the arch realist in the IR world. Somewhere between Rawls and Kissinger. Sounds like a big space. <laughs> Actually, there's a stronger version of the realist argument that doesn't want to stand between Rawls and Kissinger, but wants to take a, take a step back from that entire divide and put Rawls and Kissinger in the same camp. That kind of political theory realism says they're both naive about power, one because he ignores it and one because he indulges it. And the job of political theory realism is to get a grip on power, the implication being neither Rawls nor Kissinger have a grip on power. One neglects it. One is in love with it. There are actually lots of problems with that argument. Um, and there are lots of problems with trying to separate out political theory realism from IR realism. And lots of people have written about this. Um, part of the problem is that IR realists, on the whole, don't just fetishize or worship power. Um, I'm not even sure Henry Kissinger does. But certainly the people in that tradition don't. They're very interested in morality in politics, in norms in politics, just as it's not true that people like Rawls are not interested in power. You can't be interested in politics and not be interested in power. Rawls is interested in politics. QED, he's interested in power. Habermas, who's sometimes placed in the moralist camp, 
is also deeply interested in power. It's sometimes said that Rawls doesn't really have any influence with politicians. He only has influence with lawyers. Like he has his cachet in law schools, not in legislatures. Even if that were true, lawyers and law schools are people and places not only with an interest in power, but who often exercise it. The current president of the United States is a product of Harvard Law School, and we know, among other things, that he spent a lot of time there studying rules. So I don't think those divides work so neatly. So I'm going to try a different tack, which is to ask the question, what's wrong with moralism, from any realist perspective, on the assumption that all realists at some level are interested in power, and one of their complaints about moralists is not necessarily that they ignore power, but they misunderstand it, they neglect it, they downplay its significance. And the puzzle for me in that is, so why are realists so concerned about moralists? Because if moralists misunderstand the basic nature of politics because <coughs> they misunderstand the nature of power, they come at politics thinking it's about something that it's not about, and so they collide with power, surely power is going to win. I mean, if moralism is going to win, then they're right about politics. But if they're wrong about politics, then politics is going to chew them up and spit them out. Or at the very least, their ideas are going to bounce off politics and bounce back to the ivory tower where they can't do any harm. So that seems to me one of the puzzles about moralism. It may be that, that therefore moralism isn't a dangerous idea. It's just a stupid one, and it's just an academic dispute. But lots of realists imply that it's dangerous. It's not just stupid. It's dangerous. So I want to give an example <coughs> drawn from the history of political thought to illustrate this. And it's a thinker who isn't often cited in these arguments. So one of the difficulties with separating out IR realism and political theory realism is the same people get cited by both. So Thucydides comes up, Hobbes comes up, Weber comes up on both sides. This is someone who tends not to be cited by either side. That's Jeremy Bentham, the great utilitarian philosopher. Bentham is sometimes assumed, caricatured as some kind of naive moralist because he had an ethical view of the world, utilitarianism, and a set of principles, and he was thought then just to apply them willy-nilly to the world regardless of human variety and human difference. So not only is that a caricature, it's not actually true. It also misses the fundamental feature of Bentham, about Bentham, which is that he was a classic realist. So Bentham passes the test first because he was obsessed with power and obsessed with the institutional manifestations of power, and secondly because he was a staunch anti-moralist. He hated moralizing in politics. He hated when people talked in general sweeping terms about justice and right. He particularly hated the language of natural rights, which he famously thought was nonsense. He hated talk about social contracts and consensual underpinnings of politics that justify political arrangements. He thought all of that was nonsense talk. The phrase he used to describe it was, I quote, nugatory and dangerous. And the question is, if it's nugatory, that is, if that's the right way to pronounce that word, uh, meaning inconsequential, why is it dangerous? Because Bentham was a consequentialist. So if you're a consequentialist, how can something that's inconsequential be dangerous? That's the question. And Bentham had, I think, a fairly clear answer to that question, which is one possible answer, which is that moral talk in politics is a kind of smokescreen. And he had a general sort of weak version of that argument, and then he had a more specific strong version of that argument. And he moved between the two, and he drifted from the weak to the strong over the course of his lifetime. The weak and more general version of the argument is that moral talk in politics is kind of like the fog of war. It's just this sort of miasma that makes it really hard for anyone to see what they're doing. It just adds to the confusion. That's the problem with it. The reason it's dangerous is it makes it much harder for people to know what they ought to do because they can't see clearly because all this moral nonsense gets in the way. The stronger version of the argument was that it's a smokescreen in a different sense, in that it's a deliberate creation of something behind which people can hide. So if on the first version of it, moralism is a mistake because it makes it harder for people to know what to do, on the stronger, more critical version, it actually makes it easier for people who know what they want to do but don't want other people to know it to get away with it. And Bentham's phrase for those kinds of people were they were the sinister interest in politics. And he thought that they could hide behind moral language. And you see that argument in contemporary realism, though it's not associated with Bentham on the whole. I mean, for natural rights, one of the things that realists have in their target are human rights. Part of the complaint, the weaker complaint about human rights, is that just that language adds to confusion in politics. The stronger claim about human rights 
is that human rights are actually something behind which people can hide. They're a mask that can conceal sinister interests, which might be imperial or exploitative or colonial interests. And that's a streak of contemporary um, anti-moralism. So there's the Bentham kind of answer, which is that the trouble with moral talk in politics is it's a smokescreen, and it deceives people as to what's really going on. Then there's a second kind of answer, and I'm going to give you broadly three kinds of answers to this question. There's a second kind of answer, which is associated with a particular thinker, and this person does come up a lot in these debates, and that's Weber, the Weberian answer, which is that the trouble with moralism is it's a species of conviction politics, sort of conviction beliefs. And the trouble with conviction politics is not so much that it's a form of deception as that it's a form of self-deception, that people who are too convinced about the things that they believe are true about politics are blinded to the reality of politics, which is that politics is full of context and contingency and, above all, unintended outcomes. And if you blind yourself to unintended outcomes in politics, you do a lot of damage. And if you think that your convictions allow you to transcend the messiness of politics, you just end up making the mess worse. That's the kind of Weberian argument. It's cited a lot by realists. The problem with that argument is it doesn't map neatly onto the moralism-realism divide. If this is an argument between conviction and contingency, because realists can be conviction politicians too. I, I mean, it's, it's tempting when you read Weber to assume that by conviction politicians, he simply meant people with moral beliefs about politics, moral politicians. But you can be a real politique conviction politician, and I think Weber was completely aware of that as well. You can have a set of beliefs about politics which you believe are beliefs about the reality of politics that are held with the kind of conviction that blind you to unintended consequences, unforeseen outcomes, and contingency. So that's the argument that can be directed against Bentham. Not that he was a naive moralist, but, and some people make this argument, that he was a naive anti-moralist. That he was blinded by his convictions, that he understood the reality of politics, that he had a way of seeing through the fog and he could ignore the fog because he could see his way through to the real workings of power. And among other things, he neglected the ways in which the fog of morality is an unavoidable part of politics. So the classic critique of Bentham and Benthamism in these terms is from the historian Macaulay in the early 1830s, who said, among other things, of Bentham and the Benthamites, that they forget that logic has its illusions as well as rhetoric. Realism has its illusions as well as moralism. So part of the problem with the Weber thing, the conviction versus contingency argument, is that that argument can play out within realism. That argument can also play out within moralism. And I want to give an example of that. So I want to give an example drawn from a classic dispute within moral political philosophy, in some ways the classic argument, the argument from the 1970s between Rawls, the theorist of justice, and Nozick, the theorist of rights, specifically property rights. Involved, complicated argument, I'm just going to pick out one feature of something they disputed about, which was one of Nozick's arguments against rules, which looks like it's contingency versus conviction. This is the example that's known as the Wilt Chamberlain example, Wilt Chamberlain being a famous, the most famous basketball player, and this is sport, the most famous basketball player, so we're going to have a little sport detour here, the most famous basketball player of the early 1970s. And the argument goes like this, I'm going to paraphrase it and do it very briefly. Nozick says to Rawls, okay, you believe in justice, you have this set of convictions about what a just society would look like, I'm going to give you your just society. Take as long as you want, give you all the coercive instruments that you need, use the power of the state, order a society so from your point of view it looks perfectly just. So in Rawls in terms that means inequalities work to the advantage of the least advantaged, opportunities are available to all. Create your perfectly just rules in society and then I'm going to inject into your society Wilt Chamberlain basketball player. People really want to see him play basketball and they're all willing, to, all of those people are willing to hand over small amounts of money perfectly voluntarily, perfectly freely in order to enable them to see him play basketball. He won't play basketball unless people hand over these small amounts of money. He's not going to play for nothing. But if they all hand over these small amounts of money, it's going to end up in his bank account and he's going to be very, very rich. At which point you're going to have an unjust society because his wealth is not going to work to the advantage of the least advantage. What then rules, this is Nozick to rules, are you going to do about that? And it's thought to put rules on the spot because Nozick wants to say nothing unjust has happened. Where's the injustice in this arrangement? 
It's voluntary. Everyone knows what they're doing. No one minds hand handing the money over. Yet by your standards, it's unjust. So are you either going to allow the injustice, injustice to persist, or are you going to use the coercive power of the state to intervene in affairs which are not themselves unjust? So that will be a form of injustice. QED, it's injustice or injustice. So what's the response to the Wilt Chamberlain example? Well, I think there are some fairly uh, easily accessible realist responses from outside moral philosophy. So one realist response would be to say, it is true that sports people are paid an awful lot. And actually, Wilt Chamberlain died in 1999. Uh, I imagine at the end of his life, and if he were alive today, he would certainly think that he was grossly underpaid. Because he merely earned hundreds of thousands of dollars, which is what Nozick thought he would get, uh, compared to the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars that his 2015 equivalents, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, earn. He actually didn't earn much. Wayne Rooney gets paid 300,000 pounds a week not a month or a year, but a week. And the realist response is to say, the idea that that money has wound up in Wayne Rooney's bank account because lots of people have freely handed over small amounts of money knowing that that's where it's going to end up neglects the reality of the world we live in, which is the relationship between us and Wayne Rooney is mediated by vast corporate structures of power and soft coercion and commodification and advertising and soft forms of exploitation. And at the very least, we can say that the money doesn't go from us to Wayne Rooney. It goes from us to Wayne Rooney via Rupert Murdoch and Sky. So that seems to me a pretty standard realist response. And you can take it or leave it. I think there's a better realist response, which says, when you poll people and ask them who are the super rich in the societies we live in, they often assume it's people like the top basketball players, LeBron James. Maybe not Wayne Rooney doesn't earn as much as the American equivalents, or movie stars or supermodels. People, even though you might think it's ridiculous they get so much money, people of whom it is possible to identify a relationship between the money they get and the fact that they do have a talent, and that they have a talent which in some sense has been tested against other talents and found to be better, particularly of the sports players. They just are the best. Wilt Chamberlain was the best basketball player. His 21st century equivalents are equally the best. And so how, whatever you think about the amount of money that they earn, you can at least see a relationship between who they are and what they earn. But people are wrong about that. They're not wrong about that relationship, but they're wrong that that's the super rich. Because actually in our societies, on the whole, the super rich is not those people. It's people who've made their money in finance. And actually, people who've made their money in finance, it's not at all clear that the Wilt Chamberlain example has anything to do with that. It's not, so his nickname was Wilt the Stilt Chamberlain because he was very tall. So it's not Wilt the Stilt Chamberlain, it's Fred the Shred, whoever he was, or <laughs> Bob the Job Diamond, if that's his nickname. I don't know if it is or not. There's no way you can have an argument that lots of people are willing to hand over very small amounts of money in order to see those people do what they do. People would hand over small amounts of money not to see those people <laughs> do what they do. So that's a kind of argument which says making it about sport is itself a smokescreen. I think that's quite a good argument. But briefly, there's also a moralist response. So the, the rules also has, so those are the realists outside this. But inside moral political philosophy, there's also a response. I think what the moralists can say, what rules can say, or the rulesians can say, is they can just turn the argument back on Nozick. I don't see why you can't say to Nozick, you create your perfect society. We'll give you everything that you need to make sure that it's liberal and free, libertarian, fair, open involves free transactions between the people that you want. Everyone's property rights are respected. And then we will just inject into your society something, again, which is not itself a deliberate act of injustice. No one's necessarily doing anything wrong. But some kind of market failure, maybe because of failures of information exchange or communication. Not all market failures are the result of injustice. Are you just going to let that pass? This may mess up your unpatterned, patterned society in ways that actually start to look to you, even to you, like forms of injustice. Do you allow the injustice to ride, or do you use the coercive power of the state to rectify it? Because I think moralists can also say of the contingency moralists, like Nozick, your convictions might have blinded you to the unintended consequences of the things you believe. Because any set of convictions can blind anyone to the unintended consequences of what they believe. So you don't have to be a realist to think, but maybe Nozick is the conviction politician here, not Rawls. And all convictions exist somewhere on the edges of fatalism, whatever they are. Okay, very briefly, the third possible 
line of argument that you might make against moralism. I'm going to draw on a real-world example here. <clears throat> I think the third possible argument is that it is true that moral moralism, moral politics, does often bounce off the complex reality, the messy reality of real-world politics. It does often bounce off power, power structures, institutional structures. But I don't think it's true that it therefore bounces back to the ivory tower. I think you could argue that what it does is it finds its own level. It follows the path of least resistance. And so I'm going to give just one example of that. So this is from a famous day, September the 11th, 2001. Um, the event I'm thinking of didn't take place in New York or in Washington. It took place in Brighton at the TUC conference where Tony Blair was due to give a speech about public service reform. And then he was backstage, and he saw the planes hit the Twin Towers, and he canceled the speech and went back to London. That day, and the bit leading up to that day, was a low point in Blair's time as prime minister because he was deeply frustrated. And this all comes from his memoirs. I'm not making this up. He says it. Uh, he was deeply frustrated about politics because he'd come into office with a set of convictions about public service reform, uh, pragmatic convictions, but still convictions, and these were being frustrated by the reality of power politics, bumping up against Gordon Brown in number 11, public service unions. He was deeply, deeply frustrated at his inability to translate his convictions into political change. And then he saw the planes hit the towers. And as he says in his memoirs, it took him half an hour to decide on a new set of convictions. And the things that he came to believe after that half an hour, he still believed the day he left office as prime minister. So Martin mentioned I'm doing a project uh, with John Norton and others on conspiracy theories. And last week, we were looking at 9-11 conspiracy theories. And we were looking at people who, and these include architects and engineers, who see the Twin Towers fall and even 15 years later aren't willing to believe what they see. And then there are people who saw the Twin Towers fall on the day and within half an hour were certain that they knew what they saw and still believe it 15 years later. So the opposite ends of the spectrum, but it's the same spectrum. I think. I should also say that one of the things that I remember from that time is that I was writing one of the articles Martin talked about, about Tony Blair, and um, John Dunn asked me what I was working on. And I said I was writing about Tony Blair, and he said I shouldn't waste my time on ephemera. <laughs> uh, which is a remark that's always stayed with me. And yet here I am 15 years later, so we all have our problems. The point of that story is to suggest that the path of least resistance in politics is often from the domestic to the international. It's a kind of truism because it's true. And it's not because international politics is less complicated or less contingent than domestic politics, but some of the structures of institutional power, the barriers, the frustrations are not there. And the evidence for that, and I'm just going to say this in one sentence, and people don't have to agree with this, but the evidence for that is that Blair got from Brighton to Iraq quicker than he got from Brighton to public service reform. So all of that is by way of trying to suggest that there are things that realism can say against moralism. But it's also true that realism can fall prey to some of the vices of moralism that it criticizes. So a preoccupation with power can become a kind of blinkered realpolitik. And a preoccupation with contingency can become a kind of complacency or fatalism. And there's another charge that's directed against realists, and I want to use this as a bridge to get into talking about the internet, which is uh, realists are sometimes accused of being preoccupied with legitimacy at the expense of justice. And the trouble with focusing on legitimacy is that it ends up just an argument in favor of the status quo. It ends up on, as an argument that order is valuable for the sake of order. It's a kind of tautology. And the reason it goes like this, it's often, these charges are often directed against Bernard Williams and his writing particularly a phrase that has been popularized in that writing, which is called the basic legitimation demand, which is taken to be a component of this new realism, which says that the test in politics, the first question in politics, shouldn't be to ask, is this just? Is this right? But to ask of any coercive authority, what gives you the right to do that? That is, what gives you the right to coerce us? And the problem is, if you rule out moral justifications for that coercive authority, so if a state can't say, well, we have the right to do this because it's right, because, as Blair would say, it's the right thing to do. If you're not allowed to say that, what can you say? And it looks to some people that you just have to end up saying, well, we have the right to do it because you let us get away with it. 
mean, what legitimates it is the fact that no one is stopping us. And that is an argument that's directed against this, which says it becomes this kind of blinkered realism because it rules out the kinds of justifications that we would be looking for. So I think that accusation against realism is unfair and it's wrong. And I think that misunderstands the nature of the basic legitimation demand because actually it's meant to be a tool of critical politics. It's not meant to be about reinforcing the status quo. It's, about meant, it's meant to be about putting any political regime on the spot because there are ways that states can fail the basic legitimation demand test. Because part of the point of it is to ask of any political regime, is the story that you tell about what legitimates your power dependent on your power to be persuasive? In other words, is it only persuasive to the people who live under your power because you're already using your power to manipulate the truth, to coerce them, soft or hard coercion? Or is there a story that can be told about your power which is independent of your ability to use your power to craft a story? And if that's the test, Stalinism fails that test, clearly, because its legitimation story depends upon its coercive authority to be remotely persuasive. And Williams would say, and I think I would agree with him, that liberal democracy passes that test. No, not everyone would agree with that. But the point of putting it in those terms is that this then becomes an argument about genealogy, and this is why Nietzsche then actually comes into realism and is now the dominant figure in these arguments, more than Weber, more than Hobbes, more than Thucydides because it's about genealogies, including genealogies and morality. It's about understanding where these legitimation stories come from and whether the knowledge of where they come from reinforces their legitimacy or serves to undermine it. It's also why the history of political thought is so important on the realist side. So this is part of Cambridge's distinctive contribution to these arguments, which is the history of ideas is crucial to making sense of these legitimation stories because that's what explains the genealogy, so we can see where these ideas come from, their contingencies, the context in which they emerge. And I think there's a particular contribution, and this will lead me onto the internet, that Cambridge and Cambridge political thought has made to the understanding of the key idea of modern politics, which is the idea of the state. And this is kind of, this is a complicated story, and I'm going to do it in three minutes, so you'll have to bear with me. But, and not everyone who studies history of political thought in Cambridge will agree with this. But I think there is a case for saying that what legitimates the idea of the modern state, as it were, what allows it to serve its purpose, is that it deliberately obscures the answer to the question of who rules. That actually it's constructed in order to make it very difficult to know whether it's government or people, rulers or ruled, us or them. It's an inherently double idea. It's ambivalent. It's Janus-faced. That's its point. That's what legitimates it because it creates a kind of space of safety in which you do not have to force that question. And if you do not have to force that question because you can have a kind of double answer to that question, you open up the space for political experimentation under conditions which are safe or peaceful. And actually, I take that to be Hobbes's core argument. Hobbes looks like he's the person who says, you have to first of all answer the question, who rules? But actually, behind that is his idea of the state, which deliberately makes the underpinnings of that answer ambiguous and open to all sorts of different kinds of interpretation. Now, not everyone would agree with that, but if you even halfway agree with that, it suggests that the history of political thought has lots to offer in this space. So there are the arguments that you might associate with Quentin Skinner, who wants us to see that embracing that idea of politics was itself a choice. It's not the only way to do it. There are paths not taken towards different ideas of politics with different legitimating bases, something more than just safety, neo-Republican ideas which are geared towards something closer to full participation. Or there's the question that Raymond Goyce asks. So Raymond Goyce, who's perhaps the best-known Cambridge realist, has said that the key question of politics is Lenin's question. Who, whom? Who gets to do what to whom? There are lots of variations on it. And a lot of people think that that's the most brutal kind of realism. I mean, how can you be citing Lenin in these arguments unless you're a brutal realist or a naive moralist? But actually, the who, whom question is so important because the idea of the modern state was deliberately, I think, conceived in order to obscure the answer to that question. And so the who whom question becomes a tool of criticizing the idea of the modern state. And it allows us to ask the question, there are huge advantages to obscuring the answer to the question who rules, but there are also obvious disadvantages. And at any moment in time, I think we want to ask, do the advantages outweigh the disadvantages? Is this a moment where we need to be able to answer the question who whom? Or is this part of the broader history of the modern state in which we can get away with not answering it? 
So that then leads me to the age of the internet. And I'll talk about this for 20 or 25 minutes, and then I'll stop. So we're far enough into the age of the internet now. I mean, we're not that far in. 30 plus years, not 40 yet. Um, that we can see some of its distinguishing features. I think the pattern of the age of the internet is starting to become clear. And the pattern is often associated with certain phrases that I'm borrowing from other people's writings, and I hope I understand them right. The age of the internet is the age of network effects. So what that means, among other things, is that there are certain kinds of networks where there is an advantage for the members of those networks for lots of other people to join the network. And the more people who join the network, the better the network works which means there is an advantage to being a very big network. It's an age of power laws, meaning distributions where a lot of power or wealth or privilege might accumulate to people at one end of the scale, and then everyone else has to make do with a lot less, and there is, to use the famous phrase, a very long tail. It's an age of what's called technical lock-in, which means that certain technologies, once they reach a particular level of prevalence, become very, very difficult to escape from, even for the people who want to escape from them, because you are so dependent on the technology, because so many other people use it to communicate with you. And governments find this. Even governments that are trying to free themselves from the baleful effects of certain technologies often find themselves trapped with those technologies because they have no other way of doing their business of government. It's an age of low marginal costs, meaning that there are large economies of scale here. Big enterprises often can accrue significant extra benefits once they've passed a certain size at relatively little expenditure. It means the bar there are lots of low barriers to entry on the long tail, but the barriers to entry are very high at the other end of the scale. All of this, and these things are related, means that this is starting to look like a new age of monopoly, of monopoly power and new kinds of monopolies within markets or within commerce. This is the age of Facebook, and this is the age of the NSA. So we know, thanks to Edward Snowden, <coughs> not just that the NSA spies on us, but we also know that lots of other spy agencies around the world are increasingly dependent on the NSA because of network effects, because of technical lock-in. So even to do their own spying, they often have to pass it through the technology of the Americans because the Americans control the technology that everybody needs. These big monopolies are a feature of the age of the Internet. Now, it's not all bad. There are lots of fantastic things about the age of the Internet. Um, lots of the benefits have accrued to people right at the far end of the long tail. There have been huge advantages to some of the very poorest people in the world, thanks to mobile technology. The Internet has created fantastic opportunities for en entertainment, for information, for communication. I absolutely do not think that the age of the Internet is a bad thing, but it does have this distinguishing characteristic, which means that I think we can now say of the age of the Internet that the hopes that were expressed for it at the outset, that it might be an autocracy-busting, freedom-generating machine, have not come to pass. The Chinese political system has not been undermined by the age of the internet. It turns out that Chinese government is on the sort of scale that it can take advantage of these effects. It's big enough not to be undermined by this new technology, but to be able to use it to bolster its own power. Realism and moralism each, I think, have something to say about this new age, and they each have a point of view from which to interrogate it, criticize it, try and get a grip on it. So if by moralism here I mean, broadly speaking, theories of justice, I think theorists of justice can indicate lots of ways in which this is starting to look like an unjust age because of the extraordinary levels of inequality that seem to be being generated. And by many different theories of justice, not just Rawlsian theories of justice, this starts to look unjust. It's complicated. So on the Rawlsian test, if one of the tests is, is it working to the advantage of the least advantaged? Actually, maybe it is. Maybe this technology is working to the advantage of the least advantage. But it's still hard to say that that's because of the vast accumulations of wealth at the top end of the scale. It doesn't justify that. It's also not the case that the technology is the single factor that's generating all this inequality. And the evidence for that is that the trend towards inequality predates the technology. It starts in the 1970s. But there does seem to be some correlation there. And therefore, I think moral political theory is a very useful tool for thinking about this world. Because given the problems of technical lock-in, one of the things you want is a vantage point from outside this world in order to be able to critically appraise it. And one of the things about moral political philosophy is that 
it doesn't have to depend on Google in order to criticize Google. As a moral political philosopher, you don't have to be on Facebook to wonder whether Facebook is an agent of injustice. Though it is true that lots of moral political philosophers are on Facebook, <laughs> and they spend quite a lot of their time workshopping their ideas with each other because Facebook provides a wonderful opportunity to do that. But they don't have to, and actually I think they probably don't necessarily. It's not always a good idea. So there are, there are lots of things to be said for moralism in the age of the internet, but I think the advantages are with realism. Because even if you conclude that this world is unjust, it's not clear what you do next, because there are a whole series of other questions that you immediately have to answer. And one of the things about moralism, moralism has shifted its focus from the national to the global. In political theory, it's moved out to embrace ideas of global justice. But it has its roots in ideas from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the pre or cusp of the internet age, that tend to be grounded in conceptions of power and politics, that assume that it's relatively straightforward to know who has the power, who has the legislative or jurisdictional authority to reorder our societies to make them more just. But it's not clear to me in the age of the internet that we do know that anymore. So that even if you know that this is an unjust world, it's not completely clear what you do next, what your entry point is, what your target should be, which power you try to identify as the heart of the problem, which power you try to identify as the root of the solution. Because the hardest question to answer in the age of the internet is the who whom question. It seems to me it's extremely different, difficult often to know who whom. At the very least, you have to be willing to pose it. That's the advantage of realism. But there are other advantages as well. I'm just going to go through very briefly a series of things that I think realism has to bring to bear on the age of the internet that relate to what I've been talking about in the first part of the lecture. So one of the things that realism has to offer understanding this new world is ge genealogy, a genealogical understanding of where legitimating ideas come from. And the reason that that's important is that Silicon Valley is very bad at telling truthful stories about its origins. Because the, the legitimating stories that Silicon Valley wants to tell are heroic tales of entrepreneurial initiative and lone warriors like Steve Jobs fighting against the system and the free exchange of ideas, money, information, starting in garages, spreading through the valley, creating wonderful new technology. And it always, not always, but it, in, it tends to neglect the vast influence on that story of coercive state power, particularly the kind of money that could only be spent by the American military on research and development, thanks to the state, which can extract that money from taxpayers by force and jail them if they won't pay, in order to enable the kind of wasteful spending that makes these kind of technological revolutions possible, on which you can then build Google and Facebook. So I want to quote a realist critic of the age of the internet. He's not everyone's cup of tea, but he has lots of interesting things to say. That's um, Yevgeny Morozov, who in a recent interview said, I quote, no plausible story can emerge unless Silicon Valley itself is situated within some broader historical narrative of changes in production and consumption changes in state forms, changes in the surveillance capabilities and needs of the US military. Most of the existing histories of the internet, which are in quote marks, seem to be stuck in some kind of ideational irrelevance with little to no attention to questions of capital and empire. Now you don't have to agree with the last two words in that, capital and empire, to believe that it's worth a genealogical exploration of this world. Not least because a lot of these people are actually Nozickians. Um, actually, they're worse than that. They're kind of Ayn Randians. They are full-blown conviction libertarians. And I think at the very least, we want to understand whether their legitimating stories blind them to the unintended consequences of what they do. I think it's also true that moralism follows the path of least resistance, and that's a danger in this world as well. Google's slogan, I think it still is its slogan, is don't be evil, which is a pretty moralizing slogan for a multinational corporation. So you could take the Benthamite view and say it's a smokescreen. Either it's the kind of smokescreen that's just nonsense. It just gets in the way of understanding what they're doing. Or it's actually a deliberate facade behind which they're hiding their evil intentions. I don't believe the second. I imagine they're all probably quite good people in the same way that we're all quite good people. I don't think they're trying to do harm. The danger is they might actually believe it. And moralism follows the path of least resistance out into the international sphere. <coughs> 
I don't find it hard to imagine Google executives having a kind of Brighton moment, being so frustrated with the complications, the messy reality, and Weber's famous phrase, slow drilling through hard boards of domestic politics, that they look for international outlets where their money and power can really make a difference because the institutional constraints aren't there. Their money and power might make a difference, but I would agree with realists who would say that is dangerous. The who whom question is so important in the age of the internet because this is a new age of obscurity, because it's a new age of complexity. It's very, very hard to understand this world. I don't think it's just me who finds that. I hope it's not. <laughs> you can hide behind complexity, too. I mean, I think there is more of a case there that there is a deliberate masking going on. Maybe not so much in the information technology industries, but in the world of high-tech finance where complexity, because it makes it very hard for people to see what's going on, is a perfect mask behind which it's possible to hide certain kinds of sinister interests. I think the question about complexity in the age of the internet is whether the story that I tried to tell very briefly about the state still holds, which is the fact that in politics, actually, our organizing structures that lie behind liberal democratic politics deliberately obscure the answer to the question of who rules. So there is, a, there is an inherent obscurity there. Whether the kind of obscurity about the question of who rules that you get in the age of the internet can also serve equivalent purposes, creating a space of safety within which peaceful experimentation is possible, which might be one of the arguments I think Silicon Valley could plausibly make to legitimate its, its claims to wealth and power. But I think Silicon Valley needs its hobs to explain it. And we haven't had the hobs of the age of the internet yet. And in the absence of that, I think we're still entitled to keep asking those questions. Is this the kind of obscurity, the kind of ambiguity that serves a legitimate political purpose or not? And if not, then we have legitimate political interest in trying to unpick it. I just want to, and I'm, I'm coming close-ish to the end, I want to introduce two people that I haven't mentioned so far very briefly on the realist side of this argument that in different ways I think also have something to say about the current age. So one, this is not someone who's particularly associated with Cambridge, though her picture is hanging up in King's. Uh, Judith Schlar, who was often associated with Bernard Williams, continues to be associated with Bernard Williams, around one of her ideas, which is called the liberalism of fear, which is taken to be, by some people, a key realist idea, which is basically about lowering expectations in politics, not trying to achieve the good or the best or the right or the just, but trying to avoid the worst. There are lots of aspects to the liberalism of fear. I just want to pick up on one feature of one of Schlar's arguments in her book, Ordinary Vices, which relates to my interest in hypocrisy. And that was Schlar's argument that said there are certain vices that in a liberal democratic state we have to be prepared to tolerate in order to avoid the vices that we should not tolerate. One of the vices she thought we should tolerate was hypocrisy because the vice that she thought we shouldn't tolerate was cruelty. She felt hypocrisy was an inevitable feature of democratic life. I tend to agree with her. But she also felt that anti-hypocrisy drives, trying to root hypocrisy out of politics, actually tend to open the door to cruelty because there can often be something quite cruel about anti-hypocrisy. The internet fails those tests. So the internet is not a freedom-generating machine, but it definitely is a hypocrisy-generating machine. There's definitely more hypocrisy in the world thanks to the internet than there was before the internet existed for two reasons. First of all, because the internet now means that we can record and have a record of everything anyone has ever said or done, including every politician, which means every little hypocrisy can be exposed. Once upon a time, this stuff was forgotten. But now if everything you say or do is on the record somewhere, at some point, you're going to say or do something which contradicts what you said or did in the past. As a politician, you do something now that 10 years ago you said you didn't believe in, or 10 years ago, you did something that you now say you don't believe in. And in political terms, that makes you a hypocrite. So there's more hypocrisy, but there's also more hypocrisy because anti-hypocrisy is a form of hypocrisy. Because the people who criticize politicians for this, who create Twitter storms around tiny indiscretions, would not themselves like to be on the receiving end of a Twitter storm. No one who's a member of that crowd ever does anything but react with total horror when the crowd turns on them. Which means that we're hypocrites too. Everyone on Twitter is a hypocrite, and everyone that Twitter is talking about is a hypocrite. So there's lots more hypocrisy, which means Schlar was right. There's also a lot more cruelty, because a lot of it is genuinely cruel. 
Um, I still remember that, that I'm not going to name names here, but I remember a senior politician, experienced politician, member of the House of Commons, senior academic, describing his first experience of reading the comments below the line on a piece that he'd written in The Guardian. And he, he was like someone coming back from a war zone. <laughs> he had this kind of haunted look. He'd seen horrors that he didn't even know existed. <laughs> and as he talked about it, he became tearful. He was genuinely traumatized. Because a lot of that stuff is genuinely cruel. Now, at this point, you know, th another kind of realism comes in, which says, yeah, but it's, it's not actually a war zone. <laughs> the Guardian is lots of things, but it's not a war zone. <laughs> there are real war zones out there, and no one who is realistic about politics could mistake the Guardian for Libya. So is this real realism? Is this real cruelty? It's, like, it's not sticks and stones cruelty. It's, it's name-calling cruelty, which is a form of cruelty, but isn't politics about sticks and stones cruelty? So one of Schklar's arguments was that she thought it was important to not just focus on sticks and stones cruelty, but what she called everyday cruelty, because she thought there was a relationship between the two, that actually thinking about everyday cruelty was a way of understanding abuses of the coercive power of the state, not least in allowing this kind of cruelty. Now, I have no idea. I think it's an open question, but I think it's a real question. What is the relationship between, say, the kinds of freedoms for better or for worse, that Facebook allows people in their relationships with other people on Facebook, and the relationship that we are now coming to understand Facebook has with the coercive power of the United States government. I pose that question because I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's a real question for real politics and real political theory. Realism in politics, just like moralism in politics, can follow the path of least resistance. Though there's still a danger in this world I said that moralism tended to be stuck in the 70s, 80s, 90s. When you see, read some of the contemporary realist arguments, they also feel a little bit pre this current age, in that there sometimes is an assumption that the basic legitimation demand is basic because it straightforwardly makes sense that we can understand what the channels of communication are here. But actually, in the age of the internet, it's sometimes quite hard to imagine where would the basic legitimation demand take place? What would it look like? Who would be demanding what of whom? Is it still directed at states? Or is it directed at other kinds of powers, other kinds of legitimators? And I think you can envisage circumstances in which it absolutely makes sense to imagine the basic legitimation demand literally being made by one human being of another human being. You can imagine an Iraqi citizen saying to an American soldier, what makes it legitimate for you to tell me what to do down the barrel of a gun? That's a version of the basic legitimation demand. But we can imagine it because it's in the international sphere, and we can imagine it because the American hasn't got an answer to it. It's the basic legitimation demand that will be failed, I think. But in our states, where we still want to think that our states pass that test, it's much harder to know where it applies. I want to quote two more things, a line from a Cambridge computer scientist called Ross Anderson, who's written recently about this stuff, at least as interestingly as any political theorist is writing about this stuff, about network power. And he says, even network researchers don't really know how to measure network power. And the power elite are at best vaguely aware that it exists. That's a classic realist argument. If the power elite don't even understand the nature of power in the world in which they are the elite, the elite they are at best deceived and at worst self-deceived. But it's also an explanation of why the conventional assumptions of realism no, no longer hold. Because if realism is about power, he's also saying, even the network researchers don't really know what power is in this world. So in some senses, realism has to start from the beginning again and try and work it out. There's one other thing I want to quote, which is another way in which realism can follow the path of least resistance. This is another thinker who's sometimes described as a realist. He's definitely an anti-moralist, and that's John Gray, the philosopher, moral, political, everything philosopher, John Gray. And he's got a new book out, um, and this is a line slightly unfair, just drawn from that book. I'm not really picking on him because lots of people think like this. So this is John Gray on the age of the internet. And this is a book about freedom. It is not hard to foresee circumstances in which the internet could fracture along the shifting lines of power. Abounding in worms and viruses that can be used to disrupt human armies and shut down vital utilities, cyberspace is a site of unceasing warfare. So it's classic Hobbesian realism of a kind. Partly for this reason, cyberspace could turn out to be the site of a radical evolutionary shift. Our successors may not be intelligent robots, but more highly evolved descendants of computer worms. 
you can read a lot of stuff like this. It also seems to me following the path of least resistance from starting kind of where I've just finished up, which is uh, the internet is a space where we may see fracturing along shifting lines of power quite quickly into a kind of dystopian vision that this is a site of ceaseless, unceasing warfare, and then onto the radical evolutionary shift into the post-human future, in which transformative effects will take place, which means the things that we're worrying about now will kind of be redundant. That was the kind of conviction politics that Weber was most at pains to warn people against, the idea that there is a transformative shift which will make what we worry about now seem moot. It might happen, it might not happen, but until it happens, what we worry about now is not moot, it's politics. So I think the work for political theorists to do is to stop after the first line of that quote and to try and understand what it means to make sense of this world in terms of the shifting lines of power. You don't even, as a realist, need to go on to the second line, which is to worry about the internet as a site of unceasing cyber warfare. That might happen too, but that's, that seems to me a slightly kind of fetishized realism. The real work for political theory is to try and make sense of the shifting lines of power. And like I say, I think it's barely even started. So I'll finish with two remarks. This is to come back to the parochial uh, from, I guess, the cosmic, I mean, not just the universal. So one is slightly backward looking and one is slightly forward looking. <clears throat> The backward-looking thing to say is that it is conventional in lectures like this, but this is not just convention. That leads me to say this by any means. I want to pay tribute to my two most immediate predecessors um, in, in the role that I now hold. Uh, Jeff Hawthorne, who uh, was professor of politics here and did as much as anyone to create a politics department in Cambridge, um, is also a model of a certain kind of realist thinking about politics that does not follow the path of least resistance. So Jeff is the editor of the Bernard Williams Collection, which has become the key text in this whole argument. In the beginning was the deed. Um, it, it has become the text around which these arguments now revolve. Jeff's most recent book is a book about Thucydides, who always also gets dragged into this stuff and is claimed by this kind of realist and that kind of realist, particularly in IR. And Jeff's book rescues the real Thucydides from realism in order so that we can see what's really going on there, the kinds of complex not easy to pin down themes, some of them I've been talking about here, a world of a complex relationship between conviction and contingency, in which politics, politicians are always telling, legitimating stories about their own power, and then always finding those stories coming back to bite them. It's the disabused realism, the real realism, that underpins an understanding of politics. And Andrew Gamble, who, as Martin said, was the first holder <laughs> of the chair, of which I'm very proud to be the second holder, Andrew didn't just create this building. I mean, he didn't build this building, but he enabled this building to be built. He brought together many of the people who work in this building. Uh, but in his own work, he also offers a model of how to think about the relationship between conviction and contingency in what he's written about the Thatcher period, in his work on Hayek and the tensions between the different ways that people have understood Hayek and Hayek's own different understandings of the context in which he was working, and in his work on politics and fate, there is no better book to understand the perils of fatalism than Politics and Fate by Andrew Gamble, which is a book that will never go out of date. And then the final forward-looking remark, which is that um, with John Norton and others, um, I'm engaged in an attempt to try and create in Cambridge an institute for digital society, which will exist in order to study the full range of social and political implications of the age of the internet. <clears throat> in history, in philosophy, in sociology, in economics, in law, and in computer science, to understand the shifting lines of power, the shifting lines of power within politics, within capitalism, within technology itself. And we are very aware that lots of universities have been doing this for quite a while, and Cambridge hasn't really started yet. Oxford's been doing it for a while, Harvard's been doing it for a while, Stanford's been doing it for a while. And when we talk to people about what would make the Cambridge version of this, the Cambridge Institute different? What's the Cambridge unique selling point? We have a kind of answer, which is it's because Cambridge computer science, which is as good as anywhere in the world, is at the cutting edge of what's possible in this new world. And Cambridge social science is grounded in what's not, what's not possible, <laughs> because it has, it has a streak of realism running through it. And between the possible 
and the actual, that's where real political theory does its work. I give my vote of thanks for that brilliant lecture. We have time for a couple of questions. Though there are drinks outside. So. Oh, there are drinks outside. So the questions should be short. And there, there's also an audience outside. So when you ask your question, I'll ask David to repeat it so the people outside get the benefit of the question that he is answering. Um, any questions? Yes, one there. Um, almost seemed at one point you were out to tell us your position on whether the age of the internet is fundamentally going to have to change the way we think about the state. Um, there's a lot of call for this before 2008 when you said, oh, you know, uh, modern globalization has changed, the state is no longer most important actor. And then we found out that actually when all the multinational corporations fell apart, it was the state. Yeah. But your analysis puts in something very different. Google, Silicon Valley, they're not finance So, could I draw you a little bit on, on what, what you think about that question? So, so, so the question is, um, can I say more about whether the age of the internet in some sense marks, if not the end of the age of the state, a fundamental shift in how we understand the state? It's the right question to ask because I was trying to indicate in my lecture I think it's the basic question. But not in necessarily in that pre-2008 globalization story but in the legitimation story, which seems to me the more important story, or at least it's related to that earlier story, and the different legitimation stories that are being told about the character of the state. But I do also think that, as I suggested, um, and it, I, I am very aware, even in the, especially in the condensed version, that it's much more complicated than this. But there are ambiguities that underpin the legitimacy, the legitimating stories we might tell about the modern state. And there are ambiguities that underpin the age of the internet. And I do want to suggest that one of the questions that hasn't really been asked yet is how those play off each other, how those different, because they're not the same, like you suggest, and, and there are also, you know, there's a Silicon Valley story, which is that they don't need the state anymore. And I suspect there will be a moment when the Nozickians discover that market failure <coughs> comes back to bite them and then they can create that. You know, it's, it's almost happening, like the Nozick experiment. You can create your seasteading world in which you go off and live as though you you, you, your world has been constructed by Robert Nozick for you, and then something will happen with unintended consequences that draw you back to the state. But still, I, I genuinely think that what realism has to add to this is just, not just history and context, but a focus on the different ways in which genealogies of legitimation conflict, but also overlap in this world, and we're just at the start of it. And I don't think you can get an answer to this by simply waiting for the next crisis because that's the other temptation here, the realist temptation, which is to say, well, we'll know the answer when the next really bad thing happens. Don't be evil. How do you feel about that, Google, now? Dot, 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 dot. Because that's one of the, the vices of, that Weber was warning against. Is there a second question? There must, must be from somebody. No, I think they're all anxious to, to get outside uh, and have a drink. Um, after a very, very stimulating lecture. I think that what we heard tonight is what I would call a sort of classic Runciman performance. Um, it was accessible, it was humorous, it was witty, um, striking and memorable phrases, dealing with very, very big questions. And I think it's that ability to communicate these very important issues which is uh, such a striking thing about David's work and says a lot for the future of this department of polis uh, as we move, move ahead. We hope that you're successful, David, in fundraising. This is a pitch now, of course. Uh, fundraising. I wave at the camera at this time. Right. Uh, for the, the new Centre for Digital Society.
And I know that if um, many people in the world had heard what you were saying, they, they would think this is something which is very wor much worthy of support dealing with major issues. So we wish you and the department well as you, as you move ahead uh, in addressing these major questions. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you.